Hello, reading friend, and thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend a few minutes with The Proper Study of Mankind, an anthology of essays by Isaiah Berlin. This book was originally published in 1997, and I read a 1998 American edition. So, The Proper Study of Mankind, an anthology of essays. Yeah, you know, I wanted to read this this year. I actually have four collections of essays that I wanted to get to this year, and this is the first of the four that I've actually managed to get to, and I really need to get cracking because as I'm making this video, the year is more than half over, so I have three more collections to go, but I did want to get this one read. It appeared on my radar. Um, I added it to my want to read list like back in 2017. I don't remember exactly how it how it came to my attention, but um, I decided this was my year to get it read. So what it's about, Isaiah Berlin was a very sort of well-known uh, thinker, intellectual. He lived in England in the 20th century. I believe he passed away in 1997. The essays contained in this collection were published from the years, in different years, between 1949 and 1990. So yeah, I, I think a good place to start here is with the title, The Proper Study of Mankind, because that sort of tells us what this book is going to be about. Here on the title page, it says a quote. It has a quote. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. So the proper study of mankind is man. That's from uh, an essay on man by Alexander Pope. So this book is sort of studying man. Um, Isaiah Berlin was a great student of social thought, of sort of history of ideas, and that's sort of what we're del del delving into here. I wondered how to approach this because there's a lot in here. There's, there's quite a number of essays. I think there's just eight different categories of essays with differing numbers of essays within each of those categories. Um, but I want to keep this video to my normal time frame. So I'm going to be very general and I'm going to go through what all the essays are called, kind of a general idea of what they're about and what sort of my key thoughts and themes, my sort of my key takeaways, my key thoughts and themes that I took away from my personal experience of reading this book. It definitely, each of these essays could stand alone and have an hour-long video on each, F F on each essay if, um, if you wanted to delve into it that deeply. All right, but let's just go through them, um, the different essays. So as I mentioned, there's eight different categories, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, eight different categories. The first category is called the pursuit of the ideal. Um, here he's talking about the ideal, like a utopia. Not really a utopia, but what is our ideal? What is our, what is our idea of an ideal society? What is our ideal? Uh, and what does ideal mean as meaning the very best or the, the ultimate, like it can't get any better? At that point, if you've reached your ideal, you've kind of, you know, you're no longer moving past that because you're at your ideal. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the next section is called Philosophical Foundations, and there are two essays in this section. The concept of scientific history and does political theory still exist? Sort of my key takeaway here um, was about history and can history be a science? And he argues, no, it can't be. It can never be because what it's dealing with is humankind and our ideas ideas. History is actually our story as a species, and our interpretation of our story is in constant flux. And not only that, but it's different. No matter, you know, if you're in a different culture, you're interpreting history different than someone from a different culture and a different time. So um, I just thought that was super interesting. One thing that I kind of took away from it was like this idea of power and how history can sometimes have these shortcuts. Historians, when they're writing history, when you're talking about power, Power, we know what that means, you know, but it's not something that could actually be measured. Like, X general got a lot of power. Um, we know kind of what that means, but that doesn't really go into the details. If we were going to scientifically look at that, we would need to analyze exactly what power is and what sort of, and what sort of things he did to accrue this sort of thing. Uh, so anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. The next section is called Freedom and Determinism. The essays are from Hope and, F and Fear Set Free. 
and historical inevitability. So freedom, the topics here, the key takeaways were freedom, what is freedom, and also uh, determinism. So what, in what sense are we free and in what senses it is are our lives determined for us uh, from for other things like it's inevitable that we do certain things and this sort of tension between these two has uh, woven its way through thought for centuries and centuries how much are we actually free and you know this has changed over time um, the next section is called political liberal li liberty and pluralism Two con the essay is called Two Concepts of Liberty. I thought this was super interesting because the concepts of liberty, the two concepts he's talking about here is negative liberty and positive liberty. In what ways am I free? Liberty, freedom. Um, you know, positive freedom means I have the freedom to self-express, to express myself how I want to without restrictions from someone else, from a society, from a religion, from a government. That's negative freedom. That's how much freedom you have negatively, like that's given to you from outside as opposed to originating with you on the inside. So I thought that was that was super interesting. And then the next section is called History of Ideas. And here he talks about the counter-enlightenment. Uh, well, the name of this essay is called The Count Counter-Enlightenment. Uh, the Originality of Machiavelli is the second one. The Divorce Between the Sciences and the Humanities the, are the, is the third one. And then the fourth one's called Herder and the Enlightenment. Uh, he spent a lot of time talking about the Enlightenment and its sort of counter-enlightenment that occurred in the 19th century with Romanticism. Um, so this section deals with this a lot. Also, I found it really interesting about Machiavelli, this essay on the originality of Machiavelli and how radically his ideas actually shifted thought in Europe, um, you know, from like the prince, um, away from what had been the sort of medieval mindset of what rulers should do and be. And um, he's, you know, changes that. And it's a bit shocking. And he talks about that, how Machiavelli still shocks people today with his sort of... Um, a moral, I uh, guess, approach to what makes a good leader. Like a good leader needs to be ruthless, as opposed to coming out of the Middle Ages where the Christian thought, uh, you know, dominated. Uh, so more of a, a gentle. He actually, you know, opposes that. And then um, the other sort of thing I took away here was the murder, Herder and the Enlightenment. Um, he taught Herder talks about pluralism, expressionism, and. Uh, Populism, populism, expressionism, and pluralism. So this idea of populism, of, of people need something to identify with. They need to belong to a group of some kind. And so populism can fill this cultural need. You need to feel like you belong to some society. And so populism is that, um, is that sort of sentiment. This is... Um, can, can run awry, and he gives several instances where this did has run awry in the 20th century, and it continues to kind of can run awry even today. Expressionism is not really about the art movement, but it is how our lives are actually, your life is an expression. It's a piece of art because it's unique to you. So expressionism is that doctrine that human activity in general and art in particular express the entire personality of the individual or group. So with your ind individual expression then combined with all those around you creates your society ultimately. And then finally, pluralism. Um, he re reiterates this multiple times through the book, the importance of pluralism. Um, that we are at now where there's multiple points of view and you know not an ultimate truth like has the ideal that we had in the past that I mentioned earlier but that there are multiple ideals and there are multiple truths and they change and they depend on which culture you're actually coming from a lot so I thought that was that was really interesting and then, um, let's see, the next section is called Russian Writers. This is, includes his famous essay on Tolstoy called The Hedgehog and the Fox. I thought this was really interesting. The Hedgehog and the Fox. The, the, he, the fox is a person who sees the world in sort of multi-layers, like pluralistically. Um, sees, sees the forest 
and not necessarily the trees. And then the hedge, hedgehog sees, you know, something more focused. And so that person sees the trees instead of the forest. And he argues here that Tolstoy, and specifically in the War and Peace, in War and Peace, um, exhibits both of these. He's technically a fox, but he um, is struggling to understand the hedgehog. So I thought that was really that was really interesting. He talks about Herzen and his memoirs, another Russian thinker that he spends an essay talking about his influence in Russia of the 19th century. And then he has these conversations with Akhmatova and Pasternak, poets of the 20th century. And he just uh, visits Akhmatova, actually he's in Russia in 1945. And so discusses a lot about their life there during that time, during this Stalin era. And then um, the next section is called Romanticism and Nationalism in the Modern Age. And here it talks about the apotheosis of the romantic will and nationalism. Uh, past neglect and present power are the names of the essays in this section. Nationalism, I thought, was really interesting. Nationalism is um, relatively new in human ideas. You know, we live in this era of nationalism today, so we take it for granted that maybe it's always been around. But actually, it's a relatively new um, idea of be having this sort of uh, idea of yourself as belonging to a nation state in this sense of nationalism. So I thought that was that was really cool. And then uh, finally, the last the last section is called 20th Century Figures. Here are an S, here's an essay on Winston Churchill in 1940 and uh, President Franklin Roosevelt of the United States. An essay on him. Here was really interesting because they came at the war in different ways. Uh, Churchill sort of. Um, sort of feeding into the idea, the cultural idea in Great Britain of their traditional past and the need to save that from the threat of Nazism. And then in the U.S., it was all about sort of progress into the future and sort of this optimistic, uh, you know, no fear, let's not be afraid, let's just go forward. Uh, so that was really cool, too. All right, I ran through that fairly fast. Um, there's a lot more in here. I think I've covered... Um, uh, everything that I wanted to. Let's see. Uh, not really. I, I think I have. Um, so I will stop the chat there. Um, my next chat is going to be... Let me get it open here. It is going to be The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick. A little bit of alternate history here with the man in the high castle. I am almost finished with this, so I should have a chat on this coming up fairly soon. So until next time, take care. Bye.